Before we get started, here is what is made available to you by the fact that this video is on YouTube. It's a high-tech prosthesis. First, if things move too slow or too fast, you can pause, go back, or adjust the video speed. Some students watch at 0.75 times speed, which would be absolute torture for plenty of other students, including myself. I tend to engage with YouTube at double speed. And the general guidance for those looking to get the most out of this video would likely be copied over from reading best practices, namely, watch first at a fast pace, building your understanding for the framework and the overall design and ideas, and then go back and more deliberately or carefully attend to the details the second time, looking for apparent contradictions, which tend to be misunderstandings, and seeing where the analogies are incomplete or what was not said, perhaps on purpose. In addition to speed control, YouTube auto-generates very good subtitles, which occasionally make for good comedy, but I would say are more than 95% accurate. It also makes transcripts for you, which you can copy and paste and pretend that you made your own notes. The comments section also tends to be a better place than the course's learning management software to comment on or start discussions about lecture content because you can comment as you watch and leave timestamps so people know what you're referring to. One of my favorite features of YouTube is the kind people who comment helpful timestamps for the benefit of other watchers or for the benefit of me so I know what their comment is actually referring to. Over here is where you can make me feel good about spending time making watchable videos rather than teaching my kids things. Unreinforced behavior becomes extinct, and when we don't participate in the social sphere, the most pathological voices take over. Common sense is not dead, it's just quiet, so maybe murmur a bit. If you don't have a YouTube account, please take the 180 seconds required to make one, if only so that you can participate in this minimal way. Three, two, one, zero. Education is a change of mind, not of grade level. Psychology studies the mind by seeing what explains, predicts, and controls human emotion, behavior, and thought. So we have defined education in terms of psychology. Let's see how that fits with the more general definition. Education is... The act or process of imparting or acquiring general knowledge while developing the powers of reasoning and judgment, and generally of preparing oneself or others intellectually for mature life. Education. This lecture is designed to present a broad view of education and present a range of perspectives on it to help you figure out where you stand philosophically, but also show you the potential value and usefulness of some perspectives you might not have considered or heard of before. A philosophy of education should be informed both by how one thinks education does work, what processes of mind or society are the things that educate, and how education should work, i.e. what you want as an end goal and the best way to make the identified processes work to accomplish that. There is value in each of these philosophical perspectives. The ones that repulse you the most are probably the ones that can teach you the most, since the repulsion suggests that you've avoided exposure to them. Here are the philosophies arranged on a continuum from topic or content focused to student or self focused. We'll start with perennialism and then hop the widest possible philosophical chasm to discuss social reconstructionism, a substantial part of which is critique of perennialism or its contents. And then move back to here, perennialist responses to social reconstructionism, followed by essentialism, then existentialism, and finally the gooey jelly middle of progressivism. And I'll cycle through with my own personal opinion and commentary on each. Note that this continuum does not correspond to any political spectrum, not left-right, not libertarian-authoritarian. Mapping this continuum onto politics would cause rather profound misunderstandings of the philosophies. Quoting Harold Bloom in his Western canon, To read in the service of any ideology is not, in my judgment, to read at all. End quote. And in the assessment of essentialist E.D. Hirsch, you have to be conservative if you're in education, if your aim is socially progressive. That's because 
language and the taken for granted knowledge in communication changes very slowly, no matter how loud you yell uh, uh, from your soapbox. It, it's, it's very slow to change, uh, literate culture is. I mean, you can't change what's written down in all those books in the libraries. So the uh, socially progressive movement was running up against this conservatism of literacy, you might say. Literacy itself has a kind of conservative, slow to change uh, character. First up, perennialism. If something is perennial, then it does not die. It may go away for a time, but eventually returns. Perennial flowers return in the spring, having never actually gone away, and the key problems of human cooperation and survival return to consciousness, having never actually gone away. This makes learning from history and old works of genius relevant today, tomorrow, and as long as humans persist. Perennialism generally overlaps with what is called classical education, which notes that the books and subjects we call classics are classics because they offer us useful, profound, and perhaps eternal insights. Thomas Hobbes wrote in 1651 a book called Leviathan, one of the two or three most influential works in the history of thinking about government and politics in Western society. He was writing from the midst of a raging civil war, and he argued that unless we gave all the power, unless we surrendered all ultimate control to a legitimate king, that we would all rob and kill each other. Was he right about that? Is that the way things actually work? And is the question relevant to us today when we no longer believe in kings? My take on classical education, however, is that it could be done in any of the five philosophical paradigms. We could be asking what is wrong with or what could be changed about these classic works. Even Moses himself was a revisionist. Number one, do not condemn people on the basis of their ethnicity or their color. Number two, do not ever even think of using people as private property or as owned or as slaves. Three, despise those who use violence or the threat of it in sexual relations. Number four, hide your face and weep if you dare to harm a child. In other words, since studying the classical great works is not the same as believing that they hold the eternal truths, or even inherent merit, valuing engagement with the classics is not enough to make you a perennialist. To be a perennialist, you need to believe in the inherent value of, or deep truth of, the prior best attempts to capture core key important truths. Our exemplar for perennialism will be Harold Bloom and his case, or elegy, for the Western canon. The canon really means the works that a particular tradition designates as being most essential for study by the young. And why should the young experience specific canonical works? Because of the aesthetic experience of these great works of literature. They let you know what's possible, and having the memory of this profound aesthetic experience of great literature will make you hold things to high standards and yourself to high standards as well. You'll have the memory of it. Memory is the major element in cognition, in everything that we call the humanities. If you cannot remember, then you can't think, and you can't imagine, and you can't write, and you can hardly read. If you have shallow authors chosen only for political reasons, you will not augment memory. You will not cause the mind to grow. You will put people into a state of another kind of poverty, a poverty that the school of resentment does not seem to care about. Poverty as imaginative need. Does poverty it? as imaginative lack. You sound politically frustrated, Bloom. Is that because your perennialism is actually conservatism in disguise? I refuse to say that the function of studying canonical works is to reinforce our moral suppositions. Then why choose what students can read at all? Why narrow the world for them? If science came along and saw to it that we all lived 140 years on the average, then at the moment there would be no canonical problem. So you just want students to grow their aesthetic memory and standards in the limited time they have before they die? Is this to shape them into being better people? If anything, Bloom believes the opposite, namely that reading the best of everything is going to make people want to conquer the world rather than get along well in it and be good citizens. He says this multiple times in the roughly 500 pages of the Western canon. He's not selecting these books to shape good citizens. He's selecting these books because they are the quote-unquote best 
survival of the fittest seems to be the operating principle in the canon. There are other considerations, like the fact that the work should be challenging for the reader and thus develop them cognitively, but the overriding consideration is just the aesthetic value, the experiential value of the text, making it canonical. Crossing the chasm from classical to critical, we will take as our exemplar of social reconstructionism Paulo Freire, Paulo Freire, who dedicated his life to empowering victims of Brazilian colonization and slavery through literacy, protest, and political action, and who contrasted this radical approach he called critical pedagogy with what he called the banking model of education, i.e. the idea that the teacher has something to deposit into the students and that they get this information and passively hold it, like some sort of capital, which is a no-no for this Marxist scholar. Dos que querem amar e não podem, marcha, marcha dos que se recusam a uma obediência servil, marcha dos que se rebelam, marcha dos que querem ser e estão proibidos de ser. Eu acho que, que afinal de contas, as marchas são, são andarilhagens históricas pelo mundo. For Freire and his fellow critical pedagogues, Enlightenment is realizing that you are oppressed, and teaching is moving students toward an awareness of this oppression. There is emphasis on political action based on values, and these values are the values of the students, which a critical pedagogue helps bring to the surface by communicating to the students how valuable their own experience is. Note that while this is a belief that one can change one's social world, it is not a belief that there is no spoon. It is not an epistemology that thinks that if we get enough people to believe there's no spoon, there won't be any spoons. It's an acknowledgement that if we're not acknowledging or supporting or incorporating the student's own perspective of things, then we are oppressing them and, worse, forcing them into the dominant false consciousness, whatever that happens to be at the time. And while this fits in quite well in political studies and social science and wherever your audience is open to the idea that the system wants to intentionally keep them down and suppress their natural growth, it tends not to fit so well with other disciplines. You are asking the students to recreate or, from their experience, come to knowledge of things. But this is not reducible to the constructivist version of this idea, whereby if you think it, then you made it because you made that thought. The Piagetian sense of to understand is to invent. No, the social reconstructionist sense of this recreation is a recreation with destruction. It's an even less objective idea of what truth or reality is. You do not understand, you overstand. You destroy the thing that you're supposed to stand under and comprehend by creating something newer, better, more personal to you. Simply by coming to a conclusion, you are supplanting or overthrowing what came before, and if the world pushes back, don't worry, your present is the future. This has likely been a quite effective method of cultivating self-fulfilling prophecies in the classroom and the broader social world. It is probably, and rather ironically, the most effective method of indoctrination, getting people to believe that your views are theirs or came from them to begin with which is what would tend to happen in a very unstructured classroom where people don't know what they're supposed to learn because they're supposed to express what they learn from their own insides. So they look for subtle clues that what they're saying is what you want, and you have gotten around counter-will, or the emotional need to rebel, by waiting for students to do what you want organically and then rewarding them for it. So in terms of results, it's not difficult to see why this approach would be perpetuated, enjoyed, and anecdotally thought to be extremely effective. What is less clear, since, as I said, this is not an epistemology, is why one would bother with this approach in STEM or any field with essentials to learn and an objective other than self-understanding, moral training, social change, or political action. Would someone achieving math skills be as important as becoming literate? But today, I understand this perfectly well. I have no doubt that any effort today should not be an exclusive effort of mathematics, or of the math professor. As I understand it, it should rather be an effort of the man or woman, mathematician, biologist, or physicist, 
carpenter, which is actually the effort to acknowledge ourselves as conscious, mathematized bodies. I mean, I have no doubt that our presence on Earth implied, and undeniably implies, in the invention of the world. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the following thing. That the decisive step, the decisive step that makes us capable, both men and women, was precisely the step whereby the support where we stood became the world. And the life we lived began to become existence. And in this passage, or rather during this passage, you would never encounter a geographical border. But during this transition from the support to the world is when history begins to unfold, when culture is born, language, the invention of language, thought, thought that not only penetrates within the object that is being pondered, but which is also enriched by the possibility of communication and conveyance. I believe that at this moment we have also become mathematicians. In other words, life. Life becomes existence. Life is mathematized. As I see it, and I would like to get back to this point, I believe a primary concern, not only to mathematicians, but to all of us educators who are somehow accountable for a certain amount of deciphering, should be this. Proposing to young students that at the same time, or even before they discover that 4 times 4 are 16, they should also discover a mathematical way of being in the world. My take on this is that critical theory is like a sledgehammer or a universal acid. It's designed to eat away at something and destroy something. And when we ask it to do something constructive, it's not particularly helpful. But that said, it's really good at destruction. If the French postmodernists had a theory of destroying meta-narratives and meta-understandings, the social reconstructionists have a technology of it. And the underlying assumption is that if you can destruct things like authority, social structures, and capitalism, that creates a vacuum into which the individual will be placed, and that individual will take the power of that place. It is a creative destruction which allows for a reconstruction of the student's social situation by the students themselves, and the only job of the critical pedagogy is to pose the social problems and allow for the destruction of the oppressive structures that were preventing the students from coming to the solutions. Thus, society is reconstructed in the student's image, so rather than perpetuating oppression, the critical pedagogue reconstructs a non-oppressive society with their students. But of course, Paulo Freire is a philosopher of education. He's not an educational psychologist. So let's get a little closer to our own wheelhouse, still looking at social reconstructionism. Critical educational psychology is a social reconstructionist perspective that takes the oppression and liberation idea and applies it to educational psychology itself, addressing three major themes. First, that educational psychology has existing assumptions that two cause harm, and three, we should find and resist these harm-causing assumptions. Psychology is ideological because it comes from a certain perspective, but two presents itself as if this were not the case. If we look at a case of ADHD, psychology's job is to shift blame away from a pathological institution and to pretend as though it found something in the world that explains what should be evidence of the pathology of this power-based institution that makes inappropriate demands of the child. Psychology can only understand people with reference to norms and others, and therefore prevents individuals from understanding themselves on their own terms. And we want people to understand themselves and see themselves in their own terms so that they can reconstruct their society in their own terms. And teachers can't do this for them. Students must come to accept their own wisdom and find their own wisdom on their own. The critical pedagogue can only show them how valuable and possible this is. It is their own practical wisdom, or phronesis, that will accomplish liberation from oppression or the becoming of a master oneself, the reconstruction of one's social world. Also, teaching critical thinking is problematic because it's not political enough, and 
rather than assessing the truth of claims, we should be assessing the power and intent of those claims. Note that the contrasts between perennialism and social reconstructionism are not one-dimensional. The canonical approach of perennialism is actually the one that is not seeking to tell the student what to do, whereas the liberating form of social reconstructionism is concerned with framing the student's understanding of their social environment. For perennialists, wrong answers lie in the content, and for social reconstructionists, wrong answers lie in wrong attitudes. But this is painting with a very broad brush. Returning to perennialism to get a response from the perennialists regarding the social reconstructivist critiques. Okay, so what's the end result? Is that students have absolutely no historical sense whatever. We're afflicted with what's called presentism, okay? That is this focus on the present. It's very helpful to young people to get a sense of human history, okay? All right, so, so it's another reason why young people get so upset by current politics, okay? Is because they have no sense that, you know, you know what the history of the world has been? Empires rising and empires falling and nothing but ruins. And this huge cycle of things happening. And so an election that happens, a temporary election is not the end of the world. It's not the apocalypse, okay? Oh no! Oh, that. There's nothing but the present, nothing but, or, 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 or more, spe more, more specious, okay, is like once there was a utopia. In fact, everywhere but here, everywhere but here in America is a utopia, okay, and therefore there are, pro there are problems with America, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, 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 problems, oh, hello, okay, the no sense, the horrors of history have been totally hidden from, from young people. Do you know that? The banality of public school education today, absolute emptiness, they, 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 this picture of human life, everyone nice, right? niceness, okay, is the answer, the public school education, everyone nice, be absolutely open and tolerant, make, never make any judgments, etc. But the actual hard facts of human history and world geography, I might point out, all right, they know nothing. We're becoming a nation of people who are propagandized from elementary school right on through to the graduate school in a certain vision of the world. And only the ones who, for one reason or another, uh, either experience or insight or whatever, leads them to say, wait a minute. O only those are the ones that we have to depend on. In, in a conflict of visions, you talk about two fundamentally differing visions, mm -hmm. and two, these two fundamental visions underlie an enormous amount of the Western political tradition. Yes. The constrained vision and the unconstrained vision. Mm -hmm. Under the constrained vision, whom you, uh, an, example, an exemplar would be Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. Human nature is flawed, but it's fixed. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do we erect institutions that contain our flaws and permit us to live in the best possible society, given, in effect, the fallen nature of, uh, or the fallen character of human nature. Fair? Yes, absolutely. So human, when you say constrained, it's a vision of human nature itself. Human nature is fixed, uh, flawed, and therefore we operate within constraints, the constraints human nature itself provides. Unconstrained is human nature itself is malleable, and you say that Rousseau, man is born free, but everywhere he is in yes. chains. That's the classic statement of the unconstrained yes. vision. Would you explain that? Yes, that, that, that the, th the, the things that we, we suffer uh, according to the, those of the unconstrained visions, uh, it's because of the failure of other people to be as wise or as noble as themselves, because there are no inherent reasons for us to be unhappy. So one looks at pain and difficulty in the world and says, well, this is the way life is. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, we'll never eliminate it. Let's be wise and prudent and direct institutions that make life as much better as possible. That's constrained. Yes. The unconstrained vision looks at pain and suffering and says we must remake the world. There are institutions causing this pain and suffering. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Now, let me give you another quotation. The two great revolutions in the 18th century in France and in America can be viewed as applications of these differing visions. Explain that one. Well, in France, the idea was that if you simply put the right people in charge and created the right institutions, uh, then the, all these problems would, would, would go away. Uh, in the United States, it was assumed from the outset that there were very limited things you could do, and what you needed to do above all was to minimize the damage done by the flaws of human nature. And this is why they, the United States, for example, has this constitution uh, so much lamented by some of those who believe in the French Revolution, in which this group is, is uh, offset by that group, and nobody can sort of run wild. The, the separation of powers, uh, you have uh, elections, you have constitutions, you have all kinds of things hemming you in. Uh, Condorcet, who was a great uh, supporter of the French Revolution, uh, could not understand why, they were, why there was this separation of powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and not even when at the end of, end of his life he was arbitrarily thrown into prison, where he continued to write about why the Americans have, have this separation of powers. And of course, if there had been a separation of powers, he wouldn't be writing in prison. Right, right. Could I just, 
you've got uh, France is the unconstrained vision, 18th century America is the constrained vision, the founding fathers is the constrained vision. Can I ask you if it goes even farther back? What comes to mind is Karl Popper's uh, The Open Society and Its Enemies. There's a famous chapter in there in which he contrasts Plato, mm -hmm. whom he views as a radical, uh, the man who wants rule by the philosopher kings, with Aristotle, whom he views as a kind of piecemeal reformer. What you get in Plato is the impulse to start anew, and what you get in Aristotle is the impulse to accept the givenness of things and make one change, see how it works, another change, see how yes. it works. Is, in other words, I guess what I'm getting at is, is there some sense in which these two visions can be traced all the way through the Western tradition? Oh, oh absolutely. That's, absolutely. That's a fair statement. Yes. That's how Dad did it. That's how America does it. And it's worked out pretty well so far. Moving away from the fringes somewhat, let's head next door to perennialism and visit essentialism. Essentialism most often refers to the belief that certain subjects, facts, and skills are necessary to learn if one is to function or thrive in the world. If you agree that people need some understanding of language, history, or math, then you hold an essentialist belief. Now, you may have picked up somewhere the idea that if something is essentialist, it is bad. This is what sociology textbooks will tell you, and any other scholars of the social level of analysis that want to suppress competition in the marketplace of ideas. But essentialism is at least some of the time true. When I was an undergraduate, ten whole years ago, the accusation that someone's argument was essentialist was a pretty fatal blow to the ethos of it. If Jane says, for example, that men should not be teachers because they're not as empathic as women, that is an essentialist argument, specifically because the conclusion rests on the premise that there is an essential difference between men and women with regards to empathy. The more Jane appears to think that her argument is a strong one, the more she separates herself out from the shared egalitarian values of most Canadians. So is essentialism in the philosophy of education that type of essentialism? A little bit. On the surface is the simple call to teach what is necessary and foundational. Slightly below that surface is the justification that students need these subjects and lessons because of our nature as humans or children or working class people. A highly integrative essentialist approach is that of Jordan Daddy Peterson. The books that have influenced the largest number of other books are the canonical books. And the ultimate canonical book in the West is clearly the biblical corpus, because it's influenced virtually everything. And so you have to know it, because it's implicit in everything else. And so you start there, and so you have that. And it gives you the foundation, the metaphorical foundation, the conceptual foundation, the mythical foundation, that you can use to then, well, then maybe you can now, that now Shakespeare opens up to some degree, and now Milton opens up to some degree, and Dante opens up to some degree. And you think, well, why should those open up? And the answer is, well, as the social constructionists claim, you're at least in part a historical creature. Well, then those books are about you. The, the patterns in those books are the patterns of your perceptions and your actions. And without understanding them, then you don't know who you are and you can't guide yourself properly through life. And so you, you, you come into university and you encounter experts and they say, look, this is canonical. Why? Because it's had a disproportionate influence on everything else. So you need, there's something here that you need to know about because it's about you. And, and it isn't about the you that's here now in some sense, it's about the you that can unfold across time in the, in the best possible way. So each of those works is a call to adventure. While the average essentialist doesn't dive that deep, Peterson illustrates pretty well the two dimensions or aspects of essentialism. The claims about content and the often implicit claims about the students. Our exemplar for essentialism is E.D. Hirsch. To understand his approach, imagine if we examined a year's worth of the most widely read newspapers and made note of the historical people, places, stories, fables, words, concepts, and fictional characters mentioned. In other words, which cultural touchstones or references are common enough that you seem to need them in order to understand current discussions? Just like you can't summit Mount Everest without a Sherpa and equipment, you can't understand sentences like this without knowing what Everest is, what summiting it means, what a Sherpa is, etc. So, imagine you noted all of those references and compiled lists of important knowledge that will help someone understand the culture in which they will live. This is Hirsch's essentialist approach. Initially, he called it cultural literacy, but this was misunderstood as being against multiculturalism, so the largely left-wing educational establishment banished him until he rebranded as core knowledge and restated his original principles, educating and engaging everyone to the standard that only middle-class students seemed to be able to meet, as equity and inclusion. 
the content is the same. It was the label that apparently needed changing. If you go to the inner city where we have core knowledge schools, you find that these children are absorbing this material with enthusiasm, and not just the ones at the top end of the ability scale. Uh, everybody likes facts. Kids like facts. It's only education experts who seem not to like facts. They have to have the information before they can think critically. And to give them the information is empowering. Uh, the whole anti-fact tradition has no real scientific basis to back it up. Language is dependent, absolutely dependent, upon culture. The unspoken is necessary to understanding the spoken. All kinds of shared background knowledge is critical to understanding what language says. I understood that reference. The romantic tradition in education assumed that it was taking the lead <coughs> from the impulses of the child, even as the child all the while has been urgently trying to take its lead from the powerful grown-ups whom it finds in its path. The naturally unfolding view of human development is a deeply wrong theory that has been the source of enormous inequity. Children from homes where the national cultural commons is already the home culture are already native to many things the schools must teach. The children of outsiders can gain entry to that cultural commons only through a deliberate effort of acculturation by the school. To ask such children to unfold naturally is an unwitting educational crime. The ability to act and communicate effectively within the cultural commons is a requisite to the success of any citizen, with success defined minimally as, a, as the ability to earn a good living, participate in democratic self-government, meet every other citizen as an equal. Mastery of the common code of communication is central to all of those abilities. In a modern democracy, acculturation into the cultural linguistic commons is the fundamental and inherent <coughs> duty of the school. Language mastery is dependent on knowledge mastery. The two parties to a language transaction, the speaker and the listener, the writer and the reader, have to share common unspoken conventions and common unspoken information about the topic if the transaction, the linguistic transaction, is to succeed. We've known this since the 70s. Those who lack that knowledge are prevented from fulfilling their economic and civic potentials. It's the duty of the school in a democracy to convey that enabling knowledge. I can think of no higher praise for Hirsch's work than the fact that I use his materials with my own kids. He makes these books for every level of study. This is the What Your Preschooler Should Know book. My two-and-a-half-year-old has moved on to the What Your Kindergartner Should Know book, and he loves the poems, the songs, the stories about Abraham Lincoln. They're all cultural touchstones with familiar rhythms, characters, things that he should be able to reference with other kids when he's four or five and they will understand what he's talking about. And when you look through these volumes, realize how much cultural content you have in your head that you take for granted. All the stories, poems, and characters that you wouldn't think to introduce the kid to unless you had this in front of you. It's full of culture that has stood the test of time, and it's full of facts, and... Kids like facts. Okay, but do kids like school? Do kids like being forced to hang out with only people their own age? Being told what to do on a minute-by-minute -minute basis? Being limited to one-hour periods for a study of any topic? Being evaluated by strangers with no familial investment in them? Being constantly compared to age-based ability standards despite the known vast variability in when humans tend to meet those standards? Being told that they're experiencing all of this because they and their caregivers are inadequate to the task of educating themselves. Being taught that things are done for the evaluation of others. Being told that this process is for your growth while it makes you more dependent. Being placed in categories by people who only see you in this pathological situation. Being tethered to the problems of the classmates you happen to get incarcerated with. Being shaped to be passive, predictable, unoriginal, and timid. And being taught that this is somehow natural and that homeschool are the socially awkward ones? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, but at least I won't be unoriginal. Do kids like this? Rain cannot keep me away. Fog cannot cloud my way. I march to school every day. My school is the best. Loudly I say. Rain cannot keep me away. Fog cannot cloud my way. I march to school every day. My school is the best. Loudly I say.
And have you thought about how life is meaningless in light of our inevitable death and nobody has to be born and we shouldn't impose upon the desires of students, but rather free them to pursue their own interest, their freedom and emotional experience, not any goals of the instructor being the most important consideration? If you answered that students do not like most of those things, and that their freedom and emotional experience is important, you're at least a little bit an existentialist. While psychology does have some good existentialists, like Rollo May, Carl Rogers, Irvin Yalom, and probably most relevant to psychology of education, Abraham Maslow, most of them are existential humanists. And I don't really like the humanist conflation of personal development with positive development. So my exemplar for existentialism will not be any of those. It will be award-winning educator and author John Taylor Gatto. The way you train fleas, you've got to break their spirits. If you put fleas in a container, they'll instantly leap off and head off in all directions because they have flea agendas. And even they don't all off in the same direction. They have individual agendas. So he says, you got to you got to break that autonomy in the flea first. And the way you do that is you put them in a container, small, with a lid on. And the fleas keep attempting to follow their own agenda. And they strike themselves over and over again. And if you come back in an hour or so, they're all huddled in a mass together. Now when you take the lid off, they don't even try to escape. Now you can impose your will on the flea. The minute the 11-year-old kid said that to me, I knew that I had been hired as the lid on the container. To the extent that you use education and schooling as synonyms, you've already anchored yourself. It's like a horse that has 40 pounds of lead to carry as well as the rider uh, there. They're not the same thing. Schooling tells you visually what it's about. I mean, the metaphor is drawn from a school of fish, a school of fish. You've all seen them. When one turns, they all turn. It's about inculcating, the, I'm including the finest schools in the country in this. They're all about inculcating the cues and the habits and the attitudes necessary to keep this dysfunctional economy lurching from decade to decade. And the people that we get rid of are the people who show signs that, uh, that they're not going to fit in. We get rid of most of the people who score well on the test, or haven't you figured that out yet? You have to look out for yourself. And then, of course, look out for the people you love, look out for your friends, get a little energy left over, look out for your neighbors. Don't solve the problem systematically or we're playing another utopian game where we can talk endlessly about it. Solving your personal problem is pathetically easy. It's just ripping out the indwelling curiosity cutoffs that have been planted in there. It's ripping out the fear. There's nothing to be worried about. Schooling is a form of adoption. You give your kid away at his most or his or her most plastic ears to a group of strangers. You accept a promise, sometimes stated and more often implied, that the state, to its agents, knows better how to raise your children and educate them than you, your neighbors, your grandparents, your, 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 your local traditions do. And that your kid will be better off so adopted. By the time the child returns to the family or has the option of doing that, very few want to. Their parents are some form of friendly stranger too, and why not? In the key hours of growing up, strangers have reared the kid. Now let's look at the strangers, of which you were one and I was one. Regardless of our good feeling towards you, regardless of our individual talents or intelligence. We have so little time each day with each of these kids, we can't possibly know enough vital information about that particular kid to tailor a set of exercises to that kid. Oh, some of us, you know, will try more than others, but there simply isn't any time to do it to a significant degree. So what we do is accept, and of course if we don't accept this, we're fired or harassed, we accept a state's prescription that's written in manuals. You do this first and this second and this third, and here you have a little attitude to talk to the kids. And the way the state checks on whether you've followed that diet is there's standardized tests given at intervals. If your kids do badly, it does not mean that they're bad readers or anything else. It means that they haven't been obedient to the drills the state set down, and they're marked for further treatment later on, or they're marked to be excluded from responsible jobs. By the time kids are released from the schooling experience, they're so bent to habit patterns and attitudes that very few of them deviate for the rest of their lives. I think as a school teacher, teaching in a classroom for 30 years, that that's a horrible thing because we alienate a great number of these kids from themselves and we absolutely guarantee that whatever their innate genius and talents are is very unlikely to be developed uh, efficiently. So rather than follow the states prescription, which Gatto said amounted to the seven lessons, Gatto would try to have a unique curriculum for each student, based on their interests, what they find valuable, 
and connections they can make in their community. He had one student who was interested in swimming, and he said, well, how about you go around New York and you find all of the places that have swimming pools and you just record data about them, how deep they are, the hours that they're open. You can compile that and make it available at the library. And he had projects like this for nearly all of his students, which was definitely against the rules. Gatto was breaking New York State laws in order to help students get an education. So he had to cover for his students and explain why they were absent. He said at one point there were only nine students out of his class of 50 that were actually in the classroom and he was running out of ways to explain their absences. The seven lesson school teacher was part of an acceptance speech for a teaching award that he won right before he quit teaching. The next few minutes are Gatto sharing his research into what went wrong with education in the US. It is likely not all relevant to Canada, and his analysis may be incorrect, but I think his perspective is unique and valuable, so I wanted to share it with you. Fichte in Prussia, Spinoza in Holland, and Calvin where his theology spread. But the father of this has to be Plato. These four major names spanning European history agree that the ordinary population is A, very dangerous to the social order if it learns how to think and if its imagination remains intact. And furthermore, we have this corollary that there is no way to improve this. But one of the wealthiest families on planet Earth, the family of Charles Darwin, and their former Anglican minister-trained son, Charles, says that the evolutionarily retarded are fatally dangerous to the physical integrity of the human race, the advance of civilization, because of the few evolutionarily advanced crossbreed, God forbid, with the Irish or the Spanish, evolution will march backwards into the swirling mists of the dawnless past, and nothing can change that. Now put yourself, if you're watching this, in the position of a responsible person who learns that. That if these ordinary people walking around in the American democracy, if they happen, if they happen to crossbreed with your daughter, Evolution is going to march backwards. You now have a justification beginning in 1871, second to none. You can argue with Calvin. You can argue with Spinoza. You can argue with Plato. You can argue with Fichte. This is science and mathematics. And managed to obtain a book called Principles of Secondary Education that he had written in 1917. In it, Ingalls, highly praised by the president of Harvard, lists six precise functions of the new American schooling, new in his day at least. So try these on for size. According to Ingalls, the first function of schooling is the adjustive function, the establishment of fixed habits of reaction to authority. Nothing in here about reading, writing, and arithmetic. The establishment of fixed habits of reaction to authority, in which I learned that stupid orders test this much better than sensible orders. People who follow sensible orders are just sensible. But people who follow stupid orders, those are the people you can trust. This prepares the young to accept whatever managers dictate when they are grown. Second, according to Engels, is the diagnostic function. School determines each student's proper social role. I'll bet you thought that it was determined some other way. And schools log it mathematically and anecdotally on cumulative records to justify the third function of schooling, the sorting function. School sorts children by training individuals only so far as their likely destination in the social machine, not one step beyond. The fourth function is the conformity function. As much as possible, kids are to be made alike, not from any passion for egalitarianism, but that so their future behavior will be predictable in service to market research and political research. I mean, that's quite brilliant. Next is the hygienic function, which has nothing at all to do with health. Or rather, it has a lot to do with the health of the race, as Ingalls and Conant and the school crowd, the architects, thought of the health of the race. This is a polite way of saying that school is expected to accelerate the Darwinian natural selection principle by unnaturally tagging the unfit so clearly that they will drop out of the reproduction sweepstakes. Interesting, huh? And last is the propydeutic function. That's a fancy word meaning that obviously a very small fraction of kids will have to be trained to take over the management of this system and perpetuate it. Guardians of a population 
deliberately dumbed down and rendered childlike in order that government and economic life can be managed with a minimum of hassle. And in conclusion, each well-schooled generation, you get a break after this, each well-schooled generation remembers less and less of the founding vision of America. It remembers not at all that political life here was deliberately arranged to make management difficult. Remember in third grade or fourth grade when hopefully you studied the, the uh, separation of powers? The idea is to make management very, very difficult. Which is, this is not a nation that's about consensus. What we gave the world and still what we have to give the world is argument. Premature consensus is for jerks, for serfs. We need to recall for our children and ourselves that America was given to the world as a place of argument, not as a laboratory of managed consensus. The new American dream of the great corporations and of our great imperial government is that we shall all remain childish and emotionally needy forever because that makes the task of management more efficient. And what I say to you in conclusion is that we should be done with this stunted and dishonest dream because it drives our children mad. They are human beings, not consumers. They are not human resources. I hope at least one person in this audience will break the nose of the next person who uses the term human resources in front of you. Our children are not human resources. They are not a workforce. Just kick someone in the shins who says workforce. They are not a breeding experiment to advance the efficiency of evolution. They are not lab rats, and they are certainly not subjects of an empire. To be quit of the deepening nightmare requires that we first recognize the paradox of a democratic republic attempting to be an empire. The contradictions between what we say we believe and what we do are not resolvable. The project of extending childhood was concocted thousands of years ago by male philosophers and reinvented by male philosophers in every age of history only to be ignored. Surely the mothers of the world who ended up saddled with its destructive responsibility never asked for it. Only in modern times did the idea come to be supported by powerful interests which came to see value in childishness for social and economic projects. From Plato onwards, a few thinkers have always recognized that to bring about a closely managed society, ways have to be found to keep the general population uninformed. It's uncanny how steadily that theme echoes through history. It's just that nobody quite knew how to do it or had really had the command over the society to pull it off. And except for specialized functions in the overall system, management is massively aided by making people incompetent. So they're dependent on experts to keep their lives in balance. In particular, rhetorical fluency, which allows unauthorized voices to reach out to others, had to be rationed if a stable social order was the goal. Even citizenship, the concept of active personal responsibility for the community, could not be allowed to spread very far since only a population numb to the interests of others will accept much management. Time to obey the curriculum and change topics. Most of what existentialists end up actually doing when it comes time to teach or to study would fall under progressivism, which is also called pragmatism or experientialism. Progressivism asserts that student interests can determine what content in the essential topics or subjects should be covered. It caters to individual students' needs, and it holds that students learn by doing things, or at the very least holds that something that hasn't been related to any actions has not been made real for the student. Progressivism de-emphasizes notions of truth in favor of skills and methods. What's useful to know or required to believe will change as society progresses, so more important than facts are good ways of finding out what you need to know. So from essentialism, progressivism keeps the use of key subjects and the position of teacher as at least a guide. And from existentialism, progressivism keeps the idea that students have a say in their curriculum and contribute to the making or finding of facts. For progressivists and pragmatists, nothing teaches like real-world feedback. How the world responds to your actions is how you learn what is true and even how you learn that there is truth. While the main figure in pragmatism is John Dewey, as you can see I'm scrolling through some of his quotes because he's very quotable. In fact, I have a quote from him as the sign-off on my emails, which says that if we teach today the way we taught yesterday, we give away tomorrow. A very progressivist idea.
But while he is the founder of a whole bunch of schools that did a whole lot of good, and he is one of the most quotable authors, and from anecdotal reports of people who've been in the classroom with him, he was an excellent teacher. His work is just a little bit dated, as evidenced by this quote. So I will take as our exemplar for progressivism someone who went to a John Dewey-inspired school and who is far more familiar to us, Noam Chomsky. There are contrasting conceptions of uh, who, whom education is for and uh, what it is for. So let's take a look at whom it is for. There are two views, two fundamental views. One view is that education is, higher education is uh, for basically for the elites, uh, for the privileged. Uh, the rest of the population should be dumbed down, uh, maybe allowed entry into vocational schools, uh, learn trades. Uh, there's a more general conception that lies in the background and uh, which strikingly holds across the mainstream political spectrum. The leading public intellectual of the 20th century, uh, Walter Lippmann, his view was that, uh, that we have to distinguish between uh, the intelligent minority called the responsible men and uh, what he called the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, that's the general population, who have to be uh, spectators but not participants in action, and the responsible men, uh, incidentally, anyone who ever discusses this is always part of the intelligent minority by definition. Uh, so the intelligent minority, the responsible men who are in charge of decision making, they have to be protected, in his words, from the roar and the trampling of the bewildered herd. Uh, he developed the concept of manufacture of consent, this is a new art of democracy, which has to be used to keep the uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders from interfering. He, he was actually relying on his own experience. This was, these were writings in the 1920s, and so these are called progressive essays on democracy. Uh, he was relying on his experience in the first and in many ways only official uh, US propaganda agency, the Committee on Public Information, a term that Orwell would have liked. It was the Creel Commission established during the First World War to try to drive a pacifist population into raving warmongers. And it worked pretty successfully. Uh, it uh, was led by the responsible men, the intelligent minority, who were more or less unaware that they themselves were the targets of uh, an earlier propaganda agency, the British Ministry of Information, another Orwellian phrase, which uh, was essentially designed to control the thought of uh, American elites. So they would therefore uh, participate in the great task of bringing America into the First World War on England's side. Uh, another member of the Creole Commission who was also very impressed by it was uh, Edward Bernays. Uh, he's the one of the main founders of the modern public relations industry, and his views were about the same. Uh, there has to be an intelligent minority in control, and uh, we have to have a technique he called it engineering of consent to make sure that the rabble stays in their place as spectators, not participants. Well, long before this, uh, Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson uh, was considering the question of why uh, political leaders uh, are interested in having public education, mass public education was just beginning. And he said that the ground on which eminent public servants urge the claims of popular education is fear. Uh, in their words, he says, this country is filling up with thousands and millions of voters, and you must educate them to keep them from our throats, uh, meaning educate them the right way, uh, keep their perspectives and their understanding narrow and restricted, discourage free and independent thought, and frighten them into obedience. Uh, something that's done over and over in the schools as well. We've all experienced it. If you go back uh, still farther to the framing of the Constitution, it was based essentially on the same principles. We have to make sure that the public is marginalized, uh, because otherwise there'll be trouble. The majority of the population would use their voting power to take away the property of the rich to carry out what these days we would call land reform. And obviously that would be unjust, uh, so therefore we've got to guard against democracy. Actually, it's kind of interesting that, whether consciously or not, uh, Madison was reformulating uh, Aristotle's book Politics. Aristotle reviewed the many forms of government there could be and didn't like any of them, but uh, decided that democracy would be the least bad. He's, of course, mostly thinking of Athens. And, uh, but he raised the same dilemma. He said this same problem that Madison did. He said one of the big problems of democracy is that the majority of the poor would use their voting power to take away and divide up the property of the rich, which is unjust. So Madison and Aristotle faced the same problem, but they picked opposite, they drew opposite conclusions. 
uh, Aristotle's conclusion was we should eliminate inequality, make everyone middle class, more or less. And he proposed actual measures for this, what we would call today welfare state measures, and that would overcome the problem. So reduce inequality. The Madison solution was the opposite, reduce democracy. Uh, so design a system in which the public will not be able to exercise uh, the kind of uh, free vote that would uh, threaten one of the main goals of government, which he said is uh, to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, so therefore, so same problem with opposite conclusions, reduce democracy. Um, if you look at the framing of the Constitution, that's the way it's designed. So again, in Madison's words, uh, the constitutional framework has to ensure that power is in the hands of what he called the wealth of the nation, uh, the responsible men, uh, the men who have respect for property and its rights and therefore will uh, ensure that uh, the opposite minority is protected from the majority. Uh, go back a little bit further and go back to, say, David Hume, one of the first great modern political philosophers. Uh, he wrote a book called The First Principles of Government. And in this, he, I'll quote him, uh, he wondered at the easiness with which the many are governed by the few and the implicit submission with which men resign their own sentiments and passions to those of their rulers. When we inquire by what means this wonder is brought about, we shall find that as force is always on the side of the governed, the governors have nothing to support them for, uh, but opinion. It is therefore on opinion only that government is founded, and this maxim extends to the most despotic and most military governments as well as to the most free and most popular. And in fact, in the more free and the more popular, uh, where force is less available, uh, you get the most sophisticated development of the notions of uh, manufacture of consent, engineering of consent, uh, public relations industry, and so on. Uh, and the educational system has to be enlisted in this enterprise. It's a very conscious policy. I'll return to the way it works in the modern period. Well, that's one point of view about whom education is for. Uh, another alternative point of view, including high culture, is that it's for everyone. And there's interesting work on this. Uh, one book I'd strongly recommend is if you have good eyesight, very tiny print, unfortunately, is a book by a scholarly book by Jonathan Rose. It's called The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. It's a monumental study of the reading habits of 19th century British workers. Uh, and it's pretty remarkable to see what they were reading. Uh, Rose contrasts, I'll quote him, contrasts the passionate pursuit of knowledge by proletarian autodidacts with the pervasive Philistinism of the British aristocracy. And he has good evidence for it. And pretty much the same was true uh, in the United States. So uh, in Boston, let's say, uh, in the 19th century, if, if a blacksmith had enough, could afford it, that he would typically hire a young boy to read to him while he's working. And reading meant reading classics or contemporary literature that we now consider classic. Uh, in, the fa in the factories that were the mills that were just beginning to be built in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the workers were young women from the farms. They're called factory girls. Now, there was a pretty lively labor press at the time and very interesting to read. Uh, the factory girls had plenty of condemnations of the industrial system into which they were being forced. I'll come back to it a little bit. But one of them was that it was taking away their high culture. Uh, they were used to reading contemporary literature, classics, and so on. When they were driven into the mills, uh, that was taken away for them, from them. And this, this continued. I mean, I'm old enough to remember uh, the 1930s. At that time, there was lively programs of workers' education. Well, those are two views of whom education is for, two contrasting ones. Uh, then comes the question what it is for. And here, too, there are contrasting views. The contrast is actually discussed during the Enlightenment, uh, and there's an imagery associated with it. Uh, one image is that uh, education is like pouring water into an empty vessel. And in fact, it's a pretty leaky vessel, as you all know from your experience. Uh, so you pour water into a vessel, and of course, you, all of us have been through this, and you remember nothing. Uh, the other possibility, the other alternative is uh, that education teaching should be like laying out a string along which the student can explore and progress in uh, his own way. Uh, that image comes from Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was the founder of the modern university system, also one of the founders of classical liberalism. Uh, you get to uh, John Dewey, America's greatest social philosopher a century later. Uh, he wrote that it is uh, illiberal and immoral to train children to work not freely and intelligently, but for the sake of the work earned, in which case their activity is not free, 
because not freely participated in, and as he also pointed out, it'll be a leaky vessel. Uh, those choices, contrasting choices, are very sharply drawn today. I'm sure, again, that most of you have seen in your own experience, I certainly have myself, it has very definite po policy implications right now, in fact. I just some very recent and uh, very pointed discussion of this, which I'll quote the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, main scientific organization, has a regular journal, Journal Science, and in the last couple of issues, uh, the editor, his biochemist, Bruce Albert, uh, sets forth uh, alternatives, these alternatives, very clearly. He's discussing science education in the schools, but it generalizes. So one approach he discusses is, in fact, the Enlightenment view, that teaching is laying out a string along which the student progresses in their own way through discovery and exploration. And uh, his version of it is that our goal is to make it much easier for teachers everywhere to provide their students with laboratory experiences that mirror the open-ended explorations of scientists instead of the traditional cookbook labs where students follow instructions to a predetermined result. And he contrasts that with actual practice, which is, of course, pretty much the opposite. Uh, concepts taught with an overly strict attention to rules, procedures, and rote memorization. And then he goes on to quote his own testimony to the California Standards Commission, his testimony opposing such ideas as teaching the periodic table of the elements in fifth grade, which is totally meaningless to the student. Incidentally, he points out he was unsuccessful in this. It's taught that way. And what he says is, when we teach children about aspects of science that they cannot yet grasp, then we have wasted valuable educational resources, produced nothing of lasting value, and much worse, we take all the enjoyment out of science when we do so. And he discusses DNA, his own field. He says, unfortunately, most students today are taught about DNA at such an early age that they are forced to merely memorize the fact that, here's a quote from a textbook, that DNA is the material from which genes are made. It's a chore that brings no enjoyment or understanding whatsoever. And much later, he says, when they do have the background to understand both the structure of the DNA molecule and its explanatory power, I fear that the joy of discovery has been eliminated by the early memorization of boring DNA facts. We spoil the beautiful story for them by teaching it at the wrong time. And he goes on to the college level. He says, for example, in an introductory biology class, students are often required to learn the names of the 10 enzymes that oxidize sugars. Uh, but a, an obsession with such details can obscure any real understanding of the central issue, leaves students with the impression that science is uh, impossibly dull, and costs many of them, uh, causes many of them to drop it. Uh, tragically, we have managed to simultaneously trivialize and complicate science education. As a result, far too many, for far too many, science seems a game of uh, recalling boring, incomprehensible facts, so much so that it may, may make little difference whether the factoids about science that come from a, the periodic table or a movie script. He gives some examples. Uh, again, I'm sure you've had your own experience about that. Uh, just to interpolate, I certainly have. I remember when I was a 16-year-old freshman at the University of Pennsylvania, I had to take a general chemistry course with about this many students in the audience. It was insufferably boring. And, first, and furthermore, it was completely obvious what was going to happen. So if you read the textbook, you knew exactly what was going to happen. So I never went to class. Uh, but they you know, got an A, it was okay. I actually had a friend who took notes, that helped. But the, uh, but the worst part was that they had a lab. And I knew perfectly well that if I went to the lab and carried out the experiments, none of them would work. That's kind of reflects automatic. So I didn't go to the lab. Uh, there's a, there was a manual where you had to fill in the answers to the results of the experiments. And again, entirely obvious what they were going to be. So I filled it in, you know, got an A and so on. But then I had a, but then I had a very unpleasant experience. I had to register for the next semester. And when I tried to register, uh, they insisted on my, my paying a fee for a breakage in the laboratory. <laughs> I'd never been to the laboratory. I didn't know where it was. You know, but obviously, couldn't say that. You know, so, so I had to pay $17, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, for the breakage in the lab that I never attended. And of course, I don't remember a thing from the court. I'm sure many of you can duplicate this experience. Uh, serious education is radically different. It's what Alberts was recommending. And it's the way science is actually taught at the advanced levels. So take my own university, MIT. It's a research university. Now, there's a famous, world-famous physicist, uh, late Victor Weisskopf, who, like a lot of uh, senior faculty, taught freshman courses. And he used to say that when he 
came to the first session of his freshman course, and students would ask, uh, what are we going to cover this semester? And his routine answer was, it doesn't matter what we cover. It matters what you discover. And maybe you'll discover that what I'm teaching is wrong. That would be great. That's the kind of thing we want to do. This goes on right through the graduate level. That's in a serious university. That's all there is. It's the whole curriculum. And that's actually possible all the way down to kindergarten. Uh, there are examples. So in fact, Albert in this series of articles it gives a good example. He talks about a kindergarten uh, class, which won some award in the sciences. These five-year-old kids, uh, their task, the task that was given them, uh, each kid in the, in the class was given a dish that contained seeds, uh, petals, and shells. And their task was to figure out which ones were the seeds. Uh, so kids got together in what they called a scientific conference, and they each had ideas about how you might do it. They exchanged the ideas suggested some ways of testing it, and finally carried out the test. Uh, they finally got somewhere, a little teacher guidance, but they're basically figuring it out for themselves. Uh, it ended up at a point, at the point where they were, they figured out what were the seeds, and they were dissecting the seeds. They were given magnifying glasses and could look into it and locate the embryo, which is the source of the sustenance. Now that's learning, real learning. That's Enlightenment-style learning. So it looks like Chomsky accepts a similarly dismal and conspiratorial view of the origins and function or functions of formal schooling, as Gatto does. Yet Chomsky retains a rather positive view that teachers from K to university can enlighten their students. This provides a more radical set of intellectuals, who otherwise adore Chomsky for his anarchist political views, with an axe to grind against him. One of my favorite exchanges is between him and Donaldo Macedo. Here is Macedo at McMaster. Well, first of all, I think that um, linguistics, as any other field, first and foremost, uh, should be engaged uh, in ethical work. And uh, I, uh, I have been denouncing um, uh, over many years the fact that uh, uh, we are not encouraged to study ethics. Uh, educators should be, first and foremost, you know, ethical uh, uh, individuals. You know, a teacher who is a racist uh, uh, should not be in a classroom. A teacher who is who discriminates should not uh, uh, be in a classroom. She should be weed out, or he should be weed out. So, uh, when because I was trained in linguistics mostly to to be a technician in the analysis of linguistic structures uh, from theory to practice, you know, I was never really even asked to think about language as my philosophy of language. So for me then, uh, uh, not knowing you know, the philosophy of the very field of study you know, that you have invested so many years, that, you've given, that you have been given degrees and so on and so forth, you're going to be a professional in that field and so on and so forth, you don't know, and you may engage unknowingly in unethical behavior. The academic language is a language that in many ways not lies, you know, because you know, it, 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 it often you know, encourages the use of euphemism rather than uh, uh, a language that really names reality. For example, as the example that I gave, you know, uh, we, you know, in the middle class, you know, reality, academic discourse in the so-called mainstream American schools, we avoid, you know, the use of the term oppressed. Then we come up with, you know, you know, dozens of euphemisms. You know, we go to great lengths to not name, you know, the oppressed. And then we use disenfranchised, marginalized, you know, economically marginal, at risk, you know, uh, uh, minority, and so on and so forth. My question is, why do we avoid using in oppressed? And the reason that we avoid using oppressed because we remain uncomfortable in unpacking a reality where you have oppressors. Having read the first chapter of Orwell's 1984, I think that Mercado is on the wrong track both in terms of what he's technically doing and in terms of ethics in general. But returning to his exchange with Chomsky, the exchange is in this book, which is filled with great observations like the fact that most people think they are middle class when that's not the case. Chomsky clarifies his perspective that education as it is done in our institutions is indoctrination in service of those with wealth that education should be both democratizing and enlightening, and his belief that Dewey's progressivism is what moves us in those directions. Also here is Chomsky's pragmatic observation that the more you are demonstrating through your actions the values of democracy, the less you have to advertise or praise those democratic values to get students to believe in them. And the observation that the more freedom people have in a society, the more individuals interested in directing that society tend to ratchet up the propaganda, the distraction, and the less interest in literacy any ruling elite or individuals tasked with directing these individuals who are free would want for their citizenry.
This is where we see one of the sharp distinctions between Mikado and Chomsky as Mikado is attempting to argue for a devaluing of individualism, the idea being that it serves the interest of capitalists or elitists, and Chomsky's pushback saying, no, no, this is what we're trying to defend. Chomsky tells Mikado to keep his postmodern anti-objectivity away from the hard sciences. He makes the case for telling the truth as you see it, sharing that truth honestly with your students, and he gives another statement of his belief the student-as-vessel metaphor is wrong, both in terms of how students actually learn and in terms of how students should be taught. So here's our cast of characters and philosophies. Recall that this is not equivalent to any political spectrum. Sure, the social reconstructionists are a self-described Marxist and what you might call a practicing postmodernist, but neither of the perennialists are right-wing, Camille Paglia being self-described as a pornographer and libertarian. Despite the social reconstructionists making the most noise on campuses and despite Hirsch's observation that pretty much everyone should take a conservative approach if they want to have any kind of foothold in the culture. The philosophy most ascribed to, explicitly and implicitly through actions, would have to be progressivism. Pragmatism is a powerful force in education. Hopefully this lecture has presented you with enough that you can imagine how conversations between these characters and their philosophies might go. If you have 20 minutes, you could play your own game of Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock with them. Mine looks like this. Taking our initial point of comparison, perennialism humbles social reconstructionism, which redefines essentialism, which anticipates existentialism, which questions perennialism, which incorporates essentialism, which explains progressivism, which appeases social reconstructionism, which radicalizes existentialism, which personalizes progressivism, which tests perennialism. And since we're back at perennialism, we could continue the cycle again if we wanted. And you could take any one of the triads and see how they circle around to each other. Since this is generally the point where students ask, in terms of my personal philosophy, the fact that it changes quite often makes me a pragmatist and a fallibilist. My heart is existentialist, my head is essentialist, my cosmic soul is perennialist, but all I do is progress a bit. Since my first year in undergraduate studies, true believers have tried to convince me that social reconstructionism has value, but what I see in their books and have heard in their seminars is a conflation of moral import with correctness or authority. Note that this comes from real conversations with visiting scholars from Brazil and Portugal and close readings of Freire's books and those of Henri Giroux. I have receipts in the form of four notebooks worth of notes I took on them. In undergrad, I trained myself to read while walking so I could justify with multitasking all the time I spent reading Freire and Giroux. I really tried tried. But the line must be drawn here. This far, no farther. The social reconstructionist approach is selectively postmodern in its philosophy. A sort of postmodernism for me, but not for thee, where ideology is bad, but critical ideology is just the capital T truth, or whatever critical consciousness raising anti-oppression value is currently standing in for truth. Postmodern distrust of meta-narratives stops for critical theory at their own axioms, in part because there's little separation between critical theory and a critical theorizer. So something that puts anti-oppression ideas or actions in a bad light is by definition not just oppressive in the abstract, but also oppressing the critical theorizer in the present. Note that this makes someone who cares enough about your cause to voice dissent or correctives an oppressor. They put themselves on a different moral plane. And so, so people like me are regarded as being not merely an error, but in sin. For arguments against critical theorists to be met with any other response than this, that argument would have to be sufficiently identified as more anti-oppressive, more rooted in critical theory than the one being argued against. So there is a corrective, fallibilist, falsificationist aspect to critical theory. It's just not a correction toward truth, but toward its axiomatic goals of anti-oppression. It's an example of a flaw so obvious that it can be taken down with a simple story. Four different farmers, a religionist, a historian, an empiricist, and a reconstructionist, were each worried about their crops not growing that year. The religionist tried prayer, and when that didn't work, he decided it was not God's will, but that God's will could change. The historian farmer consulted texts and elders and decided she was doing all she could to help the crops grow, but new approaches might be invented that could help. 
Enter the empiricist farmer, who portioned off a section of crops to try something new, and only if that works would she apply the idea more generally. The reconstructionist farmer noted that current methods were not working, and sought to dismantle those aspects of farming that were not directly contributing to the growth of this crop. She noted that criticism of this approach could not possibly be in service of growing the crops, unless that criticism found something else that was not helping with the crop growth. And as with everything else, if the criticism was not contributing she blocked herself off from it. Now the philosophically charitable thing to do here is to take the social reconstructionist perspective and say, well, it may be the case that the oppressive narratives or the power that I unconsciously serve are preventing me from constructing in the world a food solution better than farming, in my parable. M maybe, but the empirical farmer does have that contingency covered, with the potential help of the historian farmer. What social reconstructionism adds is not necessary, but what social reconstructionism takes away probably is. But this is just me sharing my personal philosophy. I doubt that these criticisms would apply to every version of social reconstructionism. I'm not a critical pedagogue in the same way that I'm not a Catholic. There is value in the ism, and it can do good in the world, and it has, but I have no desire to sign up or subordinate myself to all of it because there are parts of it that are entirely against my nature. I can't say that about the other four philosophies, but I can say that about social reconstructionism. Drop any other questions you have below, and I'll do them justice in comment replies. And the topics that get good discussion will get more lecture time, especially the course's final lecture, which is on what you want to talk about. I'll leave you with some miscellaneous from the cutting room floor. We'll see you next time.